Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for an MP webinar covering how to reduce legal risk in 2022, COVID vaccine policies, return to work, and more. I'm Katie Kreider, Marketing Specialist here at MP. For those of you joining us on a webinar for the first time, MP is a full service human capital management company. We offer a complete suite of products and services to support organizations through the entire employee life cycle, including HR, recruiting, payroll, benefits administration, time and attendance, and compliance assistance. We support our clients with cutting edge technical solutions, as well as proactive, reliable service and deep HR, HR and payroll expertise. At MP, we are wired for HR and help our clients succeed by aligning their people strategy with their business goals. I'm excited to introduce your presenter for today's program, Aisha Hamilton. Aisha is an attorney licensed and to practice law in New Jersey, New York, and Pennsylvania. She founded her law practice over 15 years ago and focuses on employment law. The Hamilton Law Firm team provides knowledgeable, compassionate, and professional legal services to their individual and business clients from their offices located in Princeton, New Jersey. In addition to her law practice, Aisha serves as a trustee on the board of directors for the New Jersey State Bar Association, as well as the Mercer County Bar Association. She also serves on the diversity committee and the commission on racial equality in the law for the NJSBA and is the chair of the Mercer County Bar Association diversity committee and co-chair of the C civil practice committee. In addition, she serves on the employment law committee of the New Jersey Association of Justice and is also a member of the National Employment Lawyers Association, New Jersey. In 2020, she was appointed to serve on the State Bar's Judicial and Constitutional Appointments Committee, JPAC, vetting candidates for the New Jersey Governor's Office. Aisha was named the NJSBA Solo Small Firm Attorney of the Year for 2021. Since 2005, the team at the Hamilton Law Firm provides advice, counsel and litigation services on business and employment issues to corporate and individual clients in New Jersey, New York, and Pennsylvania. The firm provides personalization, practical solution-oriented solution pre representation with an eye towards closing the deal and resolving the issue in a fair and efficient manner. Just a few housekeeping issues before we get started here today. If you would like to submit a question during the program, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. We will be sending out the recording of the webinar later today, along with the slides. And with that, I'm going to hand the mic off to Aisha. Thank you so much, Katie. I appreciate the introduction. Um, I do wanna go over the legal disclaimer. So as you heard, um, I am licensed in New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. Um, so everything we talk about today is gonna to be very general in sort of broad scope context. Um, and it's also very important to recognize that we haven't had a specific conversation about the exact fact pattern that you're experiencing. So even if you ask a question, I'm going to give you some very general information, um, and it's not meant to be legal advice for your specific fact pattern. It's just meant to be guidance to help you in how you think about these issues that we're going to talk about today. Um, <clears throat> so here we are. Um, hopefully getting through COVID, um, but then we hear numbers are rising again and we, we're having this conversation about workplace safety again and we're trying to figure out what do we do now without the FFCRA, which has already expired, and how are we going to handle leave issues, and, and what about the vaccine and mandate and masking issues and testing mandates that we're all being forced to confront in our workplaces. Um, and you know, what are the types of pushbacks that your employees are giving you? Uh, so it's really important to understand the parameters of what exemptions an employee is entitled to when we're talking about um, vaccine mandates or masking mandates or um, you know, enforcing boosters in the workplace. So let's begin by talking about the actual rules. So 
our, our conversation really is guided by a look to the FMLA, which is the Family and Medical Leave Act, and the ADA, which is the Americans with Disabilities Act. The FMLA and the ADA are your overarching federal statutes that are gonna control the conversation today. But you also may have state specific statutes that you need to be aware of. And you wanna make sure you're contacting an attorney um, who is local to your state to understand the interplay of the state specific statutes to your federal statutes. So the Americans with Disabilities Act tells tells us that an employer cannot discriminate against, a dis uh, against an employee or a job seeker because of their disability. You're going to see EEOC guidance on enforcing the ADA um, and particularly in the context of COVID, um, the COVID issues, right? The FMLA provides us with the specifics of, of what an employer who has more than 50 employees is required to provide to the employee um, to accommodate um, their medical condition. <clears throat> so we start with the premise of an employee needs to be ready, willing, and able to work. If they are not ready, willing, and able to work, they need to request an accommodation. That accommodation is requested pursuant to the Americans with Disability Act and is guided by the FMLA. The FMLA says that if that employee has worked for you for at least 1,250 hours, they get 12 weeks of job protected leave. Now, I don't know about you, but a lot of employers that come to me are confused about the difference between job protected leave and paid leave. So an employee may say, I want to use my PTO time at the start of my FMLA leave, and that's fine. An employer may require an employee to exhaust their PTO time at the start of their FMLA leave, and then it switches to unpaid leave. In the state of New Jersey, we do not, or in New York or in Pennsylvania, we do not have a requirement that the employer pay for any of FMLA leave other than sick leave, earned sick leave that is provided for within the state. And that's 40 hours um, for a, uh, a full year, a full-time employee um, having worked the, the full-time hours in that year. So if you've got an employee who is requesting an accommodation, you have to be aware of what the parameters are under the FMLA and you have to be tracking how much they've used and how much um, remains on their time and whether they've exhausted their PTO time and whether they are now, you know, what remains in the FMLA time period of that 12 weeks. You also have to be aware of the general guidance provided by OSHA that employers have to maintain a safe and healthy workplace. So that's the general overarching OSHA provision um, that has applied to all employers and particularly during COVID um, where now you had the discussion about providing PPE, providing um, partitions between uh, cubby areas, workspaces, maintaining social distancing, having mask mandates, and also leading to um, vaccination and booster policies. And then, then you look to the CDC for guidance um, on what you should be doing and what is reasonable and um, uh, sort of the best way to be proceeding forward when you're looking at your COVID policies. But most importantly, you have to have a written employee handbook. If you are without, if you're an employer of any size, I'm gonna say if you have more than one or two employees and you do not have an employee handbook, you are rolling the dice. The reason I say this is because anytime somebody files a claim, whether it's with your um, 
state specific Department of Labor or Division of Civil Rights, whether it is with the EEOC, one of the first questions that is asked during the investigation phase is provide us with a copy of your employment handbook. If you say we don't have one, the investigation starts off with the presumption that you are not doing what is reasonably necessary to provide a uh, reasonable workplace as required by the law. <clears throat> so I would be very, very careful. I will tell you that when I have cases um, where I'm defending an employer before an administrative uh, process like the EEOC or the Division on Civil Rights, um, you're making my job really, really difficult when you don't have an employee handbook to guide the workplace. Um, so please, um, if that's one thing you take away from today, please make sure you have an employee handbook. Please also make sure that you are doing training on that handbook. It is not enough to just have the written document. The EEOC's next question is, did you do annual training? So you need to make sure that you are doing that training um, and documenting it and making sure you're saving sign-in sheets of the employees who have participated in the training or have some form of con a computer tracking. Um, these are all things that larger established employers do that smaller employers struggle with. They, they forget to do it. They're not keeping a clean record. You have to do that because that is part of, of defending yourself if and when somebody files a claim against you. <clears throat> Your handbook should very clearly at this point in time, now two years post pandemic, very clearly specify what your pandemic related procedures were. Your handbook or an addendum thereto should also specify um, a, what your COVID policy was. So a great question, perfectly timed, says, does the handbook need to spell out the COVID policy if there is a separate COVID policy? Um, I'm gonna say you don't, if you have rolled out a COVID policy, and it is defined somewhere in a writing, um, you can specify that it is a, an addendum to your handbook. And then the next time you do the handbook revision, roll it into the policy. Um, but that was a great question. Um, I also wanna say, please feel free to ask questions as we go, because that makes for a great and very rich conversation. Um, <clears throat> your handbook is, the, the fallback provision, right? So that's where you're going to be providing guidance to your employees as to what is and is not acceptable. Um, and, and the reason the handbook is so important is because you're also specifying that this is a rule that is being uniformly applied across all employees. So there is no room for argument that uh, only some employees were required to follow the rules and some are not. So let's talk about some fact patterns. So you have an employee who tests positive for COVID. And this fact pattern comes up in the context of now they need to leave the, uh, the physical workplace if they've been in your physical workplace they need to quarantine at home for a certain period of time. My understanding is that the current guidance on quarantine, um, at least in our state, is five, week, uh, five days. And so you're saying to the employee, you need to go home um, and then you need to, your policy may be either you just quarantine for five days if you're not symptomatic, but if you are symptomatic, you need to come back with a negative test. Um, so, that's, that's an important thing that you're gonna spell out, whether it's an, ad, an addendum to your handbook, whether it's in your COVID policy or whether it's in your main handbook. We have another great question that says, we have an infectious disease policy. Is that enough or does it have to stay COVID? Nope, I think that's enough, right? So COVID is clearly an infectious disease. Um, it, you know, it, it provides the parameters. Now, if you are, um, it, and it depends on what your infectious disease policy says, right? So you get a lawyer on the phone 
And the lawyer will always answer with, it depends. So it depends on if your infectious disease policy provides for all of the protocols that are specific to COVID. Um, and so that's, you know, that's something you're gonna wanna make sure because maybe the infectious disease policy does not have a requirement for vaccinations or for boosters um, or for quarantining. Um, so there, you know, you'll have to take a, a careful look at that. So let's go back to our scenarios. Your employee tests positive for COVID. Oh, sorry, did not mean to do that. So your employee tests positive for COVID, but they are out of leave, right? So that, that, that fact pattern is you're not symptomatic, but you do have to quarantine for the safety of your workplace and you're out of paid leave. Um, the question you'll have to sort of address at that point is can the employee actually work from home? Are you able to, um, is the employee of, in a position where they can work from home? You're also gonna wanna make sure that the employee didn't contract COVID in the workplace itself um, and sort of go through that analysis. Um, the next question is the employee needs PTO but has no time remaining. So that kind of falls into the same, you know, are you required to give them the PTO for COVID related leave? And now again, we're just talking about COVID related leave. Um, but you're gonna to have to balance the considerations of the ADA and the FMLA with that, right? So if they have FMLA leave remaining, it is job protected leave, it is not paid leave. So you still have to allow them the leave and allow job protected leave, but not paid leave. Now here's an interesting one. The employee travels for work and then needs to quarantine upon returning. So some of you may be uh, with companies where the employee is required to go to higher risk areas, um, and then you don't want them back in the, the workplace until they have quarantined for a period and then return with a negative test. Um, but their work was for the employer. And um, I would say that you're in a position really there of saying, okay, that's gonna be paid leave, uh, and if it's, if it's a job that they can do from home, then it's, uh, you know, they're just working from home, that's the accommodation. But if they're in a job that cannot be done from home, um, then you're really going to be confronting the situation where you're gonna have to pay them for that leave. Um, an employee travels for vacation and needs to quarantine. They're going to have to be told and it's gonna to have to be part of your um, infectious disease policy or your, your COVID protocols, that if you're going to travel for a vacation, you're doing so voluntarily, but you have to build in into your PTO calculations that you're going to have to quarantine for five days, especially if you're going someplace high risk. Um, so that's gonna be something that, that has to be written in your COVID policies. Um, so I see a question that says, what happened to the COVID leave PTO? I thought that employees get two weeks of PTO COVID leave and that the PTO doesn't come out of their COVID bank. So that was under the FFCRA that expired in December of 21. Um, and so it was a temporary provision. Um, I have not seen that that has been renewed um, however, there may be state-specific provisions that provide for COVID-specific PTO time that I wouldn't be able to speak to. Um, <clears throat> so when you're looking at what it is the employee is requesting in terms of leave, be very careful about what is job-protected leave and what portion of that job-protected leave has to be paid leave. Um, in when you're looking at sort of smaller employers, um, you're, you're really, you need to be cautious about sort of the um, FMLA applies to employees with 50, or employers with 50 or more employees. Um, and so you, you want to be careful about sort of allowing a reasonable amount of leave or 
not allowing FMLA leave if you have 50 or fewer employees, but whatever you do, your policy must be uniform with respect to all employees. So you can't say, well, I really like you know, Bob and I'm gonna let him have paid leave, but Jim, I, I don't like Jim. Bob happens to be Caucasian. Jim happens to be African-American. You're gonna have a problem, right? So your, your uniform application is exactly what you need to focus on when you have written policies. And that's why written policies really, they, they've got your back when, when you get to sort of making sure that your policies are uniformly applied. Let's talk a little bit about what your workplace policies are. So when we're looking at vaccine or booster mandates, what we have seen currently is employers will say, we are requiring that you need to have two vaccine shots by a certain period of time. You need to give the employees sufficient time to actually get those two shots. They have to be typically one month apart. And then you need to, if you're going to be ruling out a booster mandate, you need to make sure that they get the booster when they're actually eligible, right? So you're gonna to have to be very careful about making sure that they fall within the eligibility criteria, that they're even eligible to get the booster before you're imposing a booster mandate. In general, workplace policies must be reasonable and justified by a business need. So if you are looking at vaccine mandates, that's reasonable. It's definitely justified by OSHA and the CDC. It's de definitely justified by the business need to maintain a safe and healthy workplace um, and to keep your other employees safe. Um, so you courts have found, um, at least certain federal courts and the courts in New Jersey have held that vaccine mandates are justified by a legitimate business need. Um, and especially where the vaccine mandate is based upon guidance from the CDC or guidance from your state's uh, government executive order um, or guidance from uh, you know, physicians um, or, or some physicians organizations, they're going to find that it was not an arbitrary and capricious rule. They're going to find that there was reasonable justification. So it really, you know, on the vaccine front, you're in good, you're in, in a good place if you are looking to justify a vaccine mandate. Um, similarly, if you build in provisions that say if you are not going to be vaccinated because of certain reasons, and we'll talk about those reasons next, you have some alternatives, right? So uh, the, better man, the better part of the mandate is to offer a masking alternative or a weekly testing alternative, um, but something that allows, uh, that, that allows the interplay between an exemption from a workplace policy because of a specific defined reason, but also maintains the health and safety of the workplace. So typically, employers are not go just going to say, oh, you qualify for an exemption. All right, you don't have to mask. You don't have to do anything else. You don't have to test. Because that may be considered running afoul of your OSHA policies to keep a safe and healthy work environment. Um, you definitely want to be checking in with the CDC and the EEOC on their guidance. They are issuing guidance, albeit slowly, um, but you want to be checking in with them on what their perspectives are on vaccine mandates, booster mandates, masking mandates, um, and then definitely how they would likely handle exemption claims if they came before them. <clears throat> So some of the litigation trends we have seen are, are interesting. Um, and if you get a chance, you know, Google, you know, COVID litigation in your, your specific states, and you'll see some interesting arguments. Some arguments are requiring 
someone to get a vaccine or to wear a mask um, violate an individual's 14th Amendment rights. These are some things that you might end up hearing from employees in your workplaces. Um, so, so far, these cases have not really held water, um, but they're newer cases. So they, you know, they haven't been dismissed outright yet because uh, courts have to go through a certain process. Um, but you, you want to hold firm to your, your workplace policy. You want to make sure that it is uniformly applied and you want to engage in that interactive discussion when an employee comes to you and says, I don't want to get a vaccine or a booster because. And so you, you, we're going to talk about what that because is um, next. You cannot, and, and you're all in HR, you know this, you cannot just deny the accommodation without having that interactive discussion. And the interactive discussion is a very fact specific, very careful back and forth between the employee. But it has to start by the employee saying, I want special treatment because I need an accommodation. Now, in some states, the employee absolutely does not have to use the word accommodation. And I would say that your safest bet is to not require that. So not to say, well, I didn't think it was an accommodation because they didn't use the word accommodation. That's not going to be a winning argument. I think it's very important for you to say, what are they asking for? They are asking for a deviation from my policy, and I need to understand why. So you have to, you have to sort of, you have to address the issue. You're going to likely encounter some work from home arguments. Um, employers are starting to want to bring people back into the workplace. Um, they're, they're wanting to, uh, despite the term, the new normal, they are wanting to return to the way it used to be. Um, there's lots of justifications for that, right? To build camaraderie, to, to have training and mentorship. These are all things that we sort of lost a little bit during our Zoom environment. Um, and that is within the employer's rights to say, well, the way I believe my workplace works best is with everybody being in the office. And I have accounted for safety provisions to make sure that this is a healthy and safe place for everybody to work. But you're going to get the pushback from the employees who say, hey, I've worked from home for the last two years. My productivity increased. In fact, all of the time that I saved from not commuting to work, I, I put into my job. So you actually got more out of me than you usually would. Um, and so at that point, you're going to really inquire more into why are they asking for this, just to make sure that there isn't a medical or a, uh, a medical issue that's at play but you are well within your rights as the employer to hold firm to what your workplace policy is. So practice tip, make sure, again, make sure that your workplace policy is clear, make sure that you are uniformly applying the workplace policy and that if somebody is asking for deviation from a workplace policy, that you are asking some more questions about it. And then if you are going to not grant the accommodation, make sure you've documented why the accommodation wasn't granted. Because um, someone like me is gonna come along <laughs> down the line and want the information on why the, why the accommodation wasn't granted so we know how to defend the case. So here we are. Here's the reason I think you're all here talking about the medical exemptions and the religious exemptions. So when you are rolling out a workplace policy about vaccine mandates, booster mandates, or testing mandates, your most common pushback is medical exemptions or religious exemptions. Now, I will tell you that 
we've seen much, much more in the way of religious exemptions because it's difficult to find a doctor who's gonna say, well, you are in a, um, you have a special uh, in, you know, compromised immunity uh, or some other special condition and I don't want you to get vaccinated. Um, so no, I know there are people out there who have a medical exemption because this particular formulation of the vaccine would react badly with them. They have an allergy. Then you've got documentation from the physician that explains that, yes, you've got this exemption and employers are gonna be hard pressed not to grant that exemption. The more interesting cases are in the realm of religious exemptions. Um, so I will tell you, I do a fair amount of work on the plaintiff side. I do a fair amount of work on the defense side. Um, and some of the calls I am getting as a plaintiff's lawyer are very interesting. So recently I had a call from an individual who said she has a religious objection to taking, you know, to being, having the vaccine administered to her. And I said, oh, well, tell me what the religious objection is. And she said, well, I believe that the vaccine is made from, you know, the, the cells of aborted fetuses or whatever the, the rhetoric was. And I said, okay, well, what's your religion? And she said, well, I'm Catholic. And I said, well, that's a tough argument, right? I, I'm not addressing the formulation of the vaccine argument. Just from a practical perspective, the Pope has come out in favor, very publicly, in favor of Catholics being vaccinated. So you're going to have an uphill battle on that one. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's other callers I've had who have said they are a part of um, a, a remote uh, religion, you know, not, not one of the big common ones that you've heard of, and that their religious leader is advising against being vaccinated. Um, I have seen in those instances where the religious leader is willing to give a letter or someone from that religious institution is willing to give a letter that says, these are the tenets of our religion and this does not fit with our religion. Um, you're, you know, you're probably going to be stuck approving that uh, religious exemption. Um, but the, the common ones uh, in you know, Catholicism, we've had cases where Jehovah's Witnesses, the sort of the, the religion as a whole has approved the use of vaccination. So while other medical exemptions and religious exemptions might have applied in the context of Jehovah's Witnesses, they do not apply in the context of vaccines specifically. Um, so one of the questions you want to have in the interactive discussion is, okay, tell me what religion it is, and then provide me with some backup. You're well within your rights to ask for that. Um, I have seen, and um, while this was a creative idea, it ended up going to litigation anyway, but there is a, I think a hospital system in uh, Georgia or Tennessee that said, okay, you have a religious exemption to, the, to taking vaccines um, and vac because the vaccines are formulated using this specific stem cell technology, but you have to certify to us that you do not use any of these other medications you, that use that specific stem, stem cell technology. Now, the problem with that is those medications are things like Tylenol and Maalox and acetaminophen and Tums, um, which all apparently these physicians came up with this list. Um, There's a list of like 50 medications that all use similar technology. So essentially saying to the employees, you have to distinguish between this being a sincerely held religious belief, which is what then grants you the exemption, or a political argument. And unfortunately, the issue of vaccines and masking mandates have become very much a political argument 
Um, so you have to be really cautious about sort of being able to distinguish that, right? Um, and the only way to be able to distinguish that is to engage in the interactive discussion about the exemption and the accommodation that the employee is asking for. Now, <laughs> you and I both know that regardless of your best efforts, you are, uh, anybody can sue anyone at any time, right, within reason. So it doesn't mean that you're not going to get sued. It just means that you are doing everything right to try and get you to having a, a really good defense if you do get sued. Um, you really have to focus on who is initiating the conversation. So typically you have established a workplace policy and the employee is going to be initiating the conversation. You have to spend some time understanding what exactly the employee is asking. You have to make sure you, you can't just say no. Um, even if you know through the grapevine that that employee is a devout Catholic, you have to engage in that conversation so that you can document the reason for either granting or denying the accommodation. So the employer's basic very, very basic obligation is to have a reasonably driven interactive discussion. So the question is, find out more, right? Find out more, ask more, be extremely respectful and polite. You may disagree with the position they're taking. Um, you may have political differences with the position they're taking, doesn't matter. That's not part of your job. You have to absolutely make sure that you are engaging in the interactive discussion. Now, employers are not required to provide an accommodation that would be unduly burdensome to their workplace. This might come up in the context of someone who says, well, I don't want to be vaccinated. I'm not going to test weekly. I'm not going to wear a mask and I want to work from home. Now they may be in a job that does not allow them to work from home. And there may be no other job that you can put them in. And so you're going to then find yourself having to take a pretty difficult decision at that point. As we discussed, you should always offer them an alternative. There should always be an option to either wear masks in the workplace and to test. The question that often comes up in the context of testing is who provides, who's gonna pay for it and how often should they test? I would say if you are able to work it with your benefits provider that the employer pays for it or that it's covered under the insurance, that's your best way to do it because that's going to be a workplace policy, right? So um, it's going to be very, you're gonna have an uphill battle when you are saying to your employee, well, you have to comply with my workplace policy at your expense. Um, typically, you, you've got to, you know, maybe get some guidance from the CDC or your physicians, you know, to say how often the testing should be. Typically, we've seen testing that's once every five days. Um, if they work on sliding shifts, you know, you'll, you'll have to come up with a schedule that works for them. Interestingly, I had a call from someone who said, I, I don't want to get vaccinated, but my employer has offered me the option to test, but I think that's a violation of my civil rights as well. Um, and I said, well, how, how is that? And he said, well, then other people will know because I'm gonna have to leave to go get tested. Other people will know that I'm not vaccinated and that's not fair. They, they're not entitled to my information. That would be a HIPAA violation. So let's talk about the HIPAA violation part of it, because I get those calls a lot. Um, it is not a HIPAA violation to ask for a vaccine card. It is not a HIPAA violation to ask yes or no, have you been test, have you been vaccinated? And it's not a HIPAA violation to ask for the test results, right? Because those are all deemed to be part of maintaining a safe and healthy workplace. Um, what I would say to you is if you are requiring employees to upload a copy of their vaccine card, 
make sure that they're uh, stored in a safe and protected way in which you would uh, store other sensitive employment information. Um, if you are receiving any other information regarding um, their medical exemption or their religious exemption, I would make sure those are placed in a very protected um, res uh, location, whether it's on your portal or in a locked room, you know, just making sure that the employee's privacy is protected in those contexts. Um, but in general, simply the question of, are you vaccinated or not, is not a HIPAA violation. Um, we do get those calls, uh, you know, a fair amount. Um, and that, that's, a, that's a problem. Um, when you get work from home requests, um, that's going to be, you know, where you're sort of having, um, you're in a, in a murky area there. Um, and it's just, it's very important to make sure that you are um, able to sort of articulate, right? The employer always has to be articulate, able to articulate a legitimate business reason for why that work for, from home request is being denied. So it's very much, very much a part of the employer's policy is the foundation of your handbook, the foundation of your COVID related policies that have to be in writing, that ha you have to be able to prove were disseminated to the employees and, and sort of a, an explanation of the business justification for those COVID policies. Um, you're going to see pushback now from employees. Um, I've seen both arguments, right? One, the pandemic seems to be over. Why do we have to do this? Um, I had one particular employee say to me, you know, you're rolling out this vaccine mandate now, which is requiring me to compromise my religious beliefs. But is the, is the health crisis really that big of a health crisis? And the numbers are better. Well, that was a couple of weeks ago and the numbers are not better now, right? So we're, it's a constantly fluctuating situation. Um, so it's, it's important to sort of um, try, try and be as firm about your policies as possible. Um, another employee argument that I actually, I don't disagree with, um, and we are seeing this play out, is the work from home arrangements do tend to support women um, and, and allow them to be um, cognizant of their childcare responsibilities in addition with sort of having a career and, and making sure they keep working. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's sort of, we've heard the term she session uh, through COVID and, and, sh and seen statistics where women and minorities have left the workplace in larger numbers because they could not balance childcare obligations. We've all become teachers all of a sudden, so the teaching obligations and making sure a kid is connected to Zoom and printing out their homework, along with the employer's requirement that they are paying you to do a job and they need you to do that job. Um, so it's, it's a delicate analysis um, and, and you, but overall, you have to make sure that you are honoring and respecting the workplace policy and the rules that guide that policy. Um, so I'm happy to take more questions. Um, I'm, you know, I, I, some of the questions I typically get, get asked are, what's the best way to, to roll out these new policies? So definitely roll them out in writing. Um, you don't have to overhaul your handbook every time you roll out a policy. You can roll out an addendum to the policy, just noting it as an addendum to the handbook. Um, you want to be really clear about it. So the writing plus the training. Um, and so those are important issues to consider as you're doing a, an in-person training or a video training on those new policies, right? So that when the EEOC asks you um, what your workplace policies are, you're able to say, I did the policies, here's the, here's the written policy, here's the handbook, and here's the number of times I did training on this policy. 
Um, so that's really important. Um, I do tell employers that I work with, the training doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be done by a lawyer, but it is important that you're sort of speaking in, in plain language and that you are um, sort of conveying the, the clear terms of the policy in a clear and effective way. Um, and that you're giving the employees an opportunity to ask questions and to get those questions answered. And the EEOC is going to feel like, yes, okay, you did, you did honor um, the, the, the sort of uh, issues in the workplace. Um, so um, here's, a, so I, I'm sorry, I missed some of the questions. So can an employee, can an employer choose not to do exemptions? I'm gonna tell you, no. <laughs> you always, and as part of the Americans with Disabilities Act, you're going to have to engage in a conversation about the accommodations that are being requested. Um, the, you know, your First Amendment, religious uh, protections and accommodations are going to be something that the employer has to have that interactive discussion about. So if you have a bright line rule that says, I'm absolutely not going to do exemptions, you're gonna get sued. That's gonna be a problem. Um, will we be able to access the recording after the call? Yes, absolutely. Um, I understand that Katie is gonna be sending out the recording to everyone who is registered. Um, the next question is when we are recruiting for candidates, can we ask the candidates if they are vaccinated? Yes, you can. And you can say that it is your company policy that you know it's a it's a job requirement that you be vaccinated to maintain the health and safety of your workplace. Um, the next question is, can your policy flex with the changing medical situation? Yeah, I really think it can, but you have to make sure to the employees how it has changed. So if your policy used to be that everybody needed to be vaccinated by a certain date, but you see that the numbers in your state are dropping and you no longer feel that the mandate relating to vaccine or masking is necessary, you wanna, you wanna in writing justify the change and then explain the change. Um, but you also want to make sure that that change is being uniformly implemented. So the place that employers get in the most trouble is in non-uniform implementation of the policies. Um, so making sure it's written, making sure it's um, trained, and making sure everybody is held to the same standard. Now, I, I will tell you that changing a medical situations, right? We go week to week and we see COVID numbers drop, COVID numbers rise. I would recommend that you don't make changes every time you feel there's a change in the market, right? Um, so wait, wait a bit um, on, on sort of making a change to your policy because, uh, and especially driven by um, COVID numbers, because you might be making a change every other week. Um, that might be a little bit frustrating for you. Um, let's see, here's another question. I'm at a healthcare facility. Many of our hospitals require vaccination, and this makes sense given that we are a, a vulnerable population. I have a private practice. Can't I not grant exemptions if that is what I choose to do as a healthcare business? Um, okay, so different facets of that question. The first facet is, as a healthcare facility, hospitals are well within their rights and have for eons been able to require the flu vaccine um, and other vaccinations to maintain the health and safety of um, a, what they call congregate care facilities, right? So there's a lot of people of high risk in a high risk population. So they would be justified in requiring the mandate. Now, you have a private practice, which means uh, your, your practice is either within the hospital confines or it is at a separate location. If your practice is within the hospital confines, likely that the hospital is going to say, well, if you want to work in our facility 
or you have um, you want privileges at this hospital, you're going to have to comply with our workplace policies, which are you know that we have a mandate rule. Um, you you can grant exemptions, right? Because um, the mandates the the hard and fast rule on mandates without exemptions is gonna be problematic. So yeah, if, if that's what you choose to do as a healthcare business, I think you have to evaluate each request for the exemption to find out why, why the person is uh, asking for the exemption. Is it a sincerely held religious belief? Is it a medical um, exemption that has been documented? And then you're able to grant the exemption. I don't, I don't think there's any, any problem with that. The next question is, can we use the advice of a private doctor, not a government agency? Interesting question. Okay, so government agencies have been perfectly clear on what their mandate rules are. Um, private physicians, by and large, uh, find that they're, again, you know, I'm speaking in generalities, the private physician is likely to say something that is consistent with what the um, CDC guidance is. Um, if you are going to say my workplace policy is guided by, um, you know, this this particular physician's guidance, you don't even have to list their name. I would just make sure you have documentation that guides what the workplace policy is and why, you know, why internally, how you came to develop that policy that was guided by this physician's memo to, to your office or to your workplace. Um, you've gotta be able to justify the business need for that workplace mandate. So yes, courts have found that guidance from private physicians where it's reasonable and justified and consistent with the CDC guidance is, is absolutely reasonable in justifying the workplace mandate. Um, so can mandates be required in perpetuity? So your, your employee handbook that's going to contain this mandate keeps going until you change it. So can you say, well, you have to be boosted and vaccinated for the COVID-19 vaccine and the flu vaccine, and you have to provide us with proof of vaccination once every year? Sure you can, right? Um, because we have, I will, I will tell you that um, by and large, at least the courts in you know, this Eastern Seaboard region where I am, are recognizing that we have and may still be in um, a global health crisis. So there may be courts in other regions of the country that don't recognize that or don't feel that the crisis is quite as severe as some courts see it to be. Um, and so you may get an employee pushing back, say in 2025, saying, there's no COVID and uh, you know, I'm not worried about COVID just like I'm not worried about the flu, so why should I have to get vaccinated? Now, in those cases, co courts will actually not look at the in individual employee situation, but what they're gonna look at is what is the type of facility you are imposing this workplace mandate on? Um, so courts have found that in prisons, these again, congregate care facilities, so nursing homes, prisons, hospital settings, um, areas where you might have a high population of at-risk either customers or employees um, that you have to be careful about your vaccine mandates and that you would be as an employer justified in requiring a vaccine mandate. Um, let's see, it's about 1.54. Um, I don't see any other questions. Um, Katie, I'm gonna hand this back to you. Amazing, thank you so much, Aisha. Lots of valuable information. Any questions that were not able to be answered on today's program will receive a response via email within five to seven days. The MPHR team is here to guide your organization on any HR compliance issues. If you'd like to learn more about how we can help assist your organization, please visit our website and set up a short 15 minute call. 
Be sure to join us next week on the same day and time for our webinar on unpacking the employee retention credit, funding for businesses impacted by COVID. Visit our website to register and to see the full calendar of upcoming events and available resources. We'll, we will be sending out a recording of today's webinar along with the presentation slides this afternoon. Thank you for joining us and have a terrific day.